I have 25 million subscribers of people who listen to every word I say and correct every mistake I make. And I could tell you how your information very confidently lands with them. And it doesn't land in the way you intend it to. And I just urge that in your upcoming books and the speeches that you make, just take that into consideration. Because when you make statements like apples are horrible, the, the worst thing you could do for your mitochondria is a fruit smoothie, it's not just taking a little bit of liberty with information, it's truly misleading people to make bad decisions for their health. That's all I'll say. Dr. Stephen Gundry is a cardiothoracic surgeon who found success leaving the operating room and shifting his focus to prevention, along with writing several best-selling books, including The Plant Paradox and his upcoming book titled Gut Check. You may have seen his content across social media, highlighting his very controversial claim that certain healthy foods are actually bad for you. His most popular claim is that foods like beans, tomatoes, whole grains, and bell peppers are actually unhealthy because they contain proteins called lectins and therefore are destroying your gut. This has drawn sharp criticism from the medical and nutrition community at large. Given the great amount of evidence showing that those who eat those foods are significantly healthier, have lower risk factors, and do not require the removal of such foods. Being fully honest here, I was one of those critics. So when Dr. Gundry's team reached out for him to come on the checkup, I made sure that we stated early and openly that if he were to come on, it would likely be a critical conversation. To his credit, he welcomed the debate. I also mentioned given that he is a cardiac specialist and I am a family medicine doc, I would like to bring in Dr. Danielle Bellardo, who is a cardiologist heavily focused on research surrounding disease prevention. In fact, she's on the committee that puts forth new guidelines aiming to decrease the number one killer of all of us, heart disease. Dr. Gundry again agreed, so here we go, the Checkup Podcast. Well, we're talking about heart disease prevention, and it's great to have two people who are passionate about heart disease prevention because for myself as a primary care provider, so many of my patients come in too late already with heart disease, and then we're focusing on trying to reverse that and reverse that not just through medication methods, but also giving them some lifestyle modifications, and that takes a lot of work because currently the American Standard Diet is an absolute disaster. The, the things my patients are consuming, high ultra-processed foods, very, very problematic. But Dr. Gundry, I'd like to start with you because part of, uh, I would say, your success on social media and with your books, The Plant Paradox, has been that the advice doctors, the medical system, gives to patients when it comes to diets, including what we call healthy foods, are actually unhealthy. Tell us about that. Yeah, I think that's uh, certainly my observation over the last 50 odd years that I've been doing this. Um, as a heart surgeon, we knew that if we put a stent in someone or did a bypass, we'd probably see them uh, for their next procedure in five to seven years uh, in general. And we were taught that this was inevitable and there's not much we could do to slow down the process. Statins, blood pressure medications, lifestyle modifications, exercise more. Mm -hmm. uh, but in fact, those were really piddly little things in the scheme of things. So when I, 28 years ago, watched a gentleman from Miami, Florida, Big Ed in all my books, mm -hmm. reverse 50% of the blockages in his coronary arteries, which were basically totally occluded, in six months' time, with a diet and taking a bunch of supplements willy-nilly from a health food store, mm -hmm. I knew uh, that he was on to something and spent the last 28 years figuring out how he did it. That's interesting to me because, you know, in medicine, we always look at anecdotal situations as perhaps not the strongest level of evidence. So why did this one case, because I have patients that come to me, follow all sorts of unique diets. I have patients who have been smoking for 45 years and they're living a healthy life and they say, it's because I smoke. And obviously we laugh about it because we all agree that it's not true. So why did this one case move you so? Actually, let me uh, stop you right there. Probably it's because he smoked that he's doing so well. Okay, we need to back up. How, how do we get there? Uh, well, I have a whole chapter in Gut Check, mm -hmm. looking at the healthiest, longest living people. And one of the unique features of most of the Blue Zones 
is that particularly the men are heavy smokers. Mm -hmm. And the smoking, actually the nicotine in cigarettes, is one of the best mitochondrial uncouplers that's ever been discovered. And we've looked at this through the wrong, wrong lens. We said, wow, what other healthy lifestyle things are these guys doing that's preventing smoking from harming them? In fact, we should have looked at it the other way. What is it about these people who are smokers that allows them to live to 105, 110 years old? And when you do that, then you say, okay, smoking was good for them. Why don't we see the oxidative stress that smoking we all know occurs? Why don't we see the cancers in these people? And it's because the rest of their diet facilitates the absorption of the oxidative stress in these guys. So your state is that if you smoke but eat in this specific way, you can negate the effects of smoking, the negative effects of smoking. Yeah, what's fascinating as a heart surgeon, uh, way back in the good old days, most of our patients were smokers. And they had specific proximal lesions in their coronary arteries. The rest of their blood vessels were absolutely gorgeous. And they were skinny for the most part. So, how did you gauge that? Did you? What do you mean? We operate on. But you operate on what other vessels that you saw? Like you would do peripheral arterial disease sure. screenings on yeah. those patients, yeah. and you would find. I used to operate on because one of the blood number vessels. one risk factors for peripheral arterial disease is smoking. Correct, because the smoking, the oxidative stress, mm -hmm. isn't facil isn't stopped by our current diet. Let me give you an example. Okay. Um, we're one of the few animals that don't make vitamin C. Mm -hmm. And vitamin C, and I've written about this. So normally, unfortunately, collagen breaks as blood vessels flex and contract. Mm -hmm. And it breaks primarily at bends. And when that collagen breaks, vitamin C normally rebuilds that, rebuilds that collagen. In smokers, they don't have vitamin C because the vitamin C has been used up in handling the oxidative stress. So they have basically raw collagen that sits out. And then we start the process of an inflammatory attack. And cholesterol is basically a spackling compound and just keeps spackling that area. The great news about smoking is that it always happens at these bends where flexion occurs. If, like these people in the blue zones who live a very long time as smokers, if you have huge amounts of vitamin C-containing foods in your diet, and incidentally, olive oil doubles our own vitamin C production, which is kind of cool, then you mitigate those effects and you don't see the negative effects of smoking. You actually see the positive effects of nicotine. Is there research that backs up where if you change someone's diet to have high vitamin C content, that there negates their risk of smoking? Because I've never seen that. Yeah, that's all been done in the blue zones. Well, that blue zones are not research studies. In fact, you've been quite critical of blue zones, even in your book. Yeah, the, for instance, um, let's take Sardinia, for example, one of the blue zones. Only the people who live up in the mountains actually have longevity. The people who live down by the water don't. What's different about those people is that they are sheep herders and goat herders. And what they eat is a large amount of fermented sheep cheese, sheep yogurt. And what makes them have longevity is that the men, 95% of the men smoke and only 25% of the women don't. What's unique is, as we all know, women live about seven years longer than men. The men in Sardinia have seven year longer lifespan than the women because they're smokers. That's what but that's brings a, them that's up. That's an incredible conclusion to come to. Same with the Catavans. But, but I'm saying Lynn, like, there's so, so many variables Stephen, that influence one's life. How are you isolating the one? We, we one have piece. trouble isolating that's anything in research. Look at the Catavans. Stefan Lindeberg spent his lifetime studying the Catavans in Papua New Guinea. They smoke like fiends. They've never had a documented case of a stroke or coronary artery disease. Never had a documented case of lung cancer. I'm confused how in this scenario we're using blue zones as an example for this, but then in your book, you 
point out that in Okinawa, you feel that the blue zone is untrue because they may be trying to collect pensions and their family members are not reporting their deaths appropriately. So how on one hand are you using blue zones as a form of backing up what you're saying versus other times saying it's actually the whole thing. I'm talking about coronary artery disease and longevity. Right. So these people don't have coronary artery disease, despite the fact that they're smoking. So I'm saying we should actually look at this backwards and say, wait a minute, all these people are smokers. Is there a benefit to smoking, to nicotine? I'm not saying, don't get me wrong, I have never had a cigarette in my life. But we negate the fact that maybe we're missing a positive benefit. For instance, the reason I poo-poo the blue zones is because Dan Butner would like to convince us the grains and beans are the secret of longevity of the blue zones. And since you brought up Okinawan, they don't eat grains and beans. They don't eat rice. 85% of their diet is a purple sweet potato. They don't eat soy unless it's fermented. They don't eat tofu. They eat miso and natto, which are fermented soy. And they get the benefits of the fermentation. So give you another example in another blue zone, the Nagoya Peninsula in Costa Rica. This is like a gerrymandered district. Everybody in Costa Rica eats beans and corn. That's their staple. But in the Nagoyan Peninsula, and only in that part of the country, they're sheep herders. And they eat sheep, cheese, sheep, yogurts, which actually contain large amounts of medium-chain triglycerides, which are great mitochondrial encouplers. And the Nagoyan Peninsula people say that grains and beans are the negative aspect of their diet that's compensated for by their other lifestyle. I think I have to back up. <laughs> Do you think that the Blue Zone Project is a valuable thing for us to look at as a form of evidence? Uh, no. So why are you using it to describe all these things to me that... Because there are interesting factors that influence these people, but it's not the factors that a certain individual would want us to believe. Interesting. Uh, Paul Simon said, a man hears what he wants to hear and disregards the rest. Mm -hmm. And if you're... And that's not what you're doing. No, I'm saying, what is it that makes these areas unique? And look, I'm the only nutritionist who spent most of his career living in a blue zone, Loma Linda, California. So I ought to have some idea. Where they eat a ton of beans in Loma Linda. <laughs> Actually, they don't eat a ton of beans in Loma Linda. They eat a ton of nuts. And, they eat lots of nuts. Yep, lots, lots of, of nuts. And 50% of their diet is fat, primarily from milk products. What's your take um, on the Blue Zone Project as a whole? So I think the Blue Zones are interesting as, a, um, as an idea to talk about. But when we form dietary recommendations, I'm a believer in evidence-based nutrition, which is synthesizing multiple levels of evidence to be able to come to a conclusion for what will be a healthy dietary pattern. Um, you know, nutrition is complex because there's no placebo in uh, nutrition studies. So we essentially can't look at one study, one anecdote to form our recommendations for what's healthiest. You have to look at multiple levels of evidence. So we have preclinical studies, a lot of what Dr. Gundry talks about, things with mitochondria that are very interesting, but they're hypotheses, they're mechanisms. We look at those in rats, we look at them in vitro, but then we have to look at, well, what happens in actual human studies? So then we look at outcome trials. So we wanna look at randomized controlled trials where you're actually randomizing people to a certain dietary intervention and then evaluating them based on a placebo control. Then we have long-term epidemiological studies because you can't randomize someone to something for 15 years. But then we have large cohort data for nutrition epi where we look at the effects of the intakes at certain doses of foods over time with outcomes, evaluating it based on outcomes like cardiovascular disease, autoimmune disease, GI disease, things like that. And so you have to synthesize all multiple levels of evidence to be able to come to a picture and a conclusion of what the recommendations for a diet are. Um, last year, we published, um, I was fortunate to be the lead author of our latest cardiovascular disease and nutrition guidelines for the American Society of Preventive Cardiology. And, you know, we had to evaluate and synthesize multiple levels of evidence looking at, you know, various different kinds of studies. And so, although the blue zones are really interesting, I think they tell us that, 
you know, you can have a wide variety of diets because if you look at Greece, for example, in the blue zones versus you look at Okinawa, Japan, they have different amounts of fat that they intake. They have different amounts of um, carbohydrate intake and they have multiple, you know, success and longevity um, across various different um, intake ratios of carbohydrates, fat, protein. But I think that why the blue zones are interesting yet not super scientific is because we have to look at more controlled studies to be able to kind of really synthesize all those levels of evidence to come up with the recommendation. When you were making those guidelines, was there ever talk in between the physicians doing this as to whether or not recommend smoking along with vitamin C? So um, I will stand on the uh, fact that, uh, you know, I think that it's pretty well established in the scientific literature that smoking is incredibly harmful. It's probably, uh, smoking cessation is probably one of the most important, if not the most important um, advice we can give and help patients. Thankfully, we have lots of tools in modern medicine now to help our patients with smoking cessation because it's certainly not easy. Um, but I think that uh, we don't even have randomized controlled trials for smoking because the data is so robust. Um, just evaluating how patients um, do eventually, whether it's peripheral arterial disease, coronary disease, um, or cancer outcomes, obviously, with smoking. So that, I believe, in the scientific community um, is not really arguable at this point. And so, yes, yeah, so smoking cessation, huge recommendation for both cardiovascular disease prevention, but also probably one of the best things people can do to prevent cancers, dementia, you know, a variety of different um, diseases. And have you seen evidence of vitamin C negating the risks of smoking? No, but what I do think that Dr. Gundry may be um, pointing to is that in, you know, uh, Smoking is one variable, a very, very important variable. But of course, if someone's smoking, but they're also eating an incredibly healthful diet, living in the blue zones where, you know, they have great relationships, because that's also a portion of it. People have great um, interpersonal relationships, great community, um, lower stress levels, uh, great satisfaction with life, exercise, they're active. Smoking doesn't help them, but maybe all of these other factors are contributive to their longevity. Um, whereas if you're smoking and eating, you know, a highly processed, uh, um, hyper palatable foods and um, not exercising, it would have more of a negative impact. But we know all things considered, um, smoking cessation makes a huge impact in health. That's fair. Mm -hmm. A lot of times there's so many biases when it comes to an individual's lifespan. Uh, if they're a vegetarian, they tend to practice more healthful habits. If someone is smoking, their odds are they're also drinking, they're staying out late at night. So it, it's contributory in that way. So the takeaway here is that just because you have one bad habit, it doesn't mean that you have all bad habits as exhibited in the blue zones. Right. Um, what's your takeaway from the fact that some people in the blue zone do smoke? Is it to say we should be smoking, we should be taking nicotine. What's your takeaway from that? So the, what I take away from it is um, if you look at nicotine as a drug, uh, first, first of all, it's addictive, as any tobacco executive knows. Mm -hmm. So even I don't recommend, like Dave Asprey does, uh, taking nicotine drops and putting it under your tongue or wearing a nicotine patch. But I do think we actually have to look at whether or not nicotinic acid is a useful longevity drug. And you don't have to go very far to look at the literature looking at the various forms of nicotinic acid that are now available, like NNM or NR, nucleo, sorry, nicotinamide riboside, that these have clinical published studies on their effects on uncoupling mitochondria. So uh, give you a long Interesting story, I use uh, niacin to treat my patients who make LP little a, lipoprotein little a. It's very effective at lowering LP little a. And I and others think that LP little a is one of the most important effect, effectors of cardiovascular disease, certainly in family history. What does niacin have to do well, with the- Niacin nation? lowers LP little a No, no, how does that connect to the nicotine component? Nicotinic acid isn't niacin. Interesting. I have to jump in on this because that's a very passionate topic of mine. I just actually moderated the um, major uh, LPA session at one of our um, biggest cardiology conferences this year. And what's really fascinating from the experts I've learned um, from lipoprotein A, we no longer recommend niacin for lipoprotein A. 
Reason being is that the three biggest randomized controlled trials that looked at niacin with heart outcomes. So, you know, there's lots of things that can be great from a mechanistic theory. We have lots of ideas as to why in preclinical research you think something would be a good idea. You have to test it in actual human outcome trials to see. And when I talk about outcomes, we talk about the things that are most important. Heart attack, stroke, major adverse cardiovascular events. So the three major trials that looked at lowering lipoprotein A um, with that looked at lowering um, any cardiovascular disease risk with niacin. All showed, all three showed there's absolutely no benefic- benefit in cardiovascular risk reduction with niacin. So we no longer in cardiology recommend niacin to um, for cardiovascular disease risk for lipoprotein A because despite the fact that it lowers lipoprotein A, it actually doesn't improve outcomes. And what's interesting is that there's things that are really bad for you that actually also lower lipoprotein A, which is why lipoprotein A is complex. So the European Society of Cardiology released the latest lipoprotein A um, guidelines. And the uh, recommendations are to just lower ApoB lipoproteins as much as possible through diet, lifestyle, if they need a a statin therapy. Um, And for anyone listening that's like, what is lipoprotein A? What are you guys getting into? It's a atherogenic lipoprotein that I would agree with Dr. Gundry. It's incredibly important. It's um, now the recommendations are to have everyone screened for their, um, it's LP little a at least once in their lifetime. But we no longer recommend niacin because of the hard outcomes in the trial shows it does not reduce cardiovascular risk. And actually things that can really um, lower your LPA that are harmful. So things like thyroid disease, untreated thyroid disease can actually lower your lipoprotein A. Liver disease can actually lower your lipoprotein A. These do not reduce cardiovascular risk. A high saturated fat, high animal-based diet can actually artificially lower your lipoprotein A, and we know that raises your ApoB and can also increase cardiovascular risk. So that's why it's so important that um, as we're uh, looking at different biomarkers and evaluating cardiovascular risk, that we keep in mind the actual heart outcome trials. And we actually keep in mind what actually matters to our patients, which is heart attack, stroke, and all-cause mortality. And so now with lipoprotein A in the pipeline are specific drugs that are not out yet, but um, that are going to be lipoprotein A targeted specifically, SNPs and um, various different other um, modalities. But at this time, all of our cardiac evidence shows nice and doesn't improve it. So even though you can lower the number, it doesn't necessarily improve outcomes. So that's actually a perfect example. I think you illustrated at least in, you know, in cardiovascular disease prevention, why something may in theory and in mechanism be really interesting and useful and we may, and it's worth testing, right? So when you do preclinical research in a rat or in a uh, in vitro model, you know, you may find a really interesting theory and a really interesting mechanism that's worth exploring. That's when you translate it to human studies and you see, does this improve outcomes in humans? And we found it hasn't. Well, that's because you didn't compensate for what was going to happen with niacin in raising homocysteine and also in raising LPPLA2 levels. And if you treat the LPPLA2 increase and the homocysteine with supplements, which I published at the American Heart Association, then you negate those effects of niacin. Well, I looked up your publications, Dr. Gundry. I couldn't find anything published at AHA. Um, I saw that you had sure. one abstract yeah. that was presented at the conference, but it was never a published paper, peer reviewed. Well, abstracts are peer reviewed. Well, it wasn't, been on a, the a, a, it wasn't a study, but I, it's just that I have to be honest. It's just that that's a little misleading. I mean, it goes against our cardiology guidelines. Our, cardi- our cardiology guidelines don't recommend but niacin the, for I, lipoprotein. I realize that, yeah. but the guidelines, for instance, you. I'm sure understand that statins increase LP little a levels. Yes. In, to a, statins um, increase LP little a in a very um, clinically insignificant way. And the reason why our guidelines recommend that for people with elevated lipoprotein A that they should be on statins if they have an elevated ApoB is because the target of therapy now for lipoprotein A uh, is to keep ApoB as low as possible. Right, but the target of therapy of getting ApoB as low as possible is oxidized phospholipid ApoB measurements, and that is the only measurement that correlates with LP little a so levels. That's a, well, that's a really good theory about oxidized um, uh, It's not LPA. a theory. It's published it's, it's, by multiple it's, researchers. It's a theory because we don't have actual assays that can really disertain that. We know that the research for lowering ApoB and we know for cardiovascular mortality is incredibly sound. There's no cardiovascular organization across the board, whether it's ESC, AHA, ACC, ASPC, 
that even recommend checking oxidized levels of anything because we know that lowering ApoB is the gold standard for reducing cardiovascular risk for patients with lip elevated lipoprotein. So why wouldn't you want to measure oxidized phospholipid ApoB as? Because we as? don't have, we all, because I mean, you could, but truthfully, Gosh, it doesn't change, it, it doesn't alter uh, management because management's going to be the lower, because it's going to, the management's going to be the lower ApoB as low as possible. Well, Dr. Gunter, I think what's interesting for me here as a primary care doctor who follows guidelines like these is how do you decide, because some of the things you're proposing have really strong mechanism background, right? Like mm -hmm. you, you can explain how it works. You can explain the theory of how you can get from point A to point B. Right. But in so many times in medicine, when we start with mechanisms, once we bring it to human data, we find the complete opposite. I mean, like the simple example that my viewers probably think about is like Viagra. Initially, it was started to treat pulmonary hypertension. And then now we found out it's a great erectile medication. So it started mechanistically to treat one thing, and then it ends up going in a different direction. So well, we still use Viagra to treat pH, but <laughs> true. We, we call it just sildenafil. Yeah, it, it's the um, chocolate chip cookie mistake where yeah. we thought the, the chocolate <laughs> chips would so melt true. and they didn't. Um, and then we've also seen the same with beta blockers and cardiomyopathy. Exactly. Initially, we thought that it would be something that would be problematic. And exactly. now we see that it actually reduces uh, mortality. Exactly. So how do you make the decision of when to go from a mechanistic model where you say, look, this oxidative measurement works. I can explain to you why it works. But then if we're lacking the actual endpoints of people having less strokes by following your model, how do we prove that, that what you're saying is actually true? Well, again, that's going to take a very long time. But I see patients six days a week. I even see them on Saturdays and Sundays. And I don't need to at this point in my career. Mm -hmm. I draw blood on them every three months mm -hmm. in multiple labs, looking at, among other things, oxidized phospholipid ApoB as a marker of therapy. And a lot of my patients see other physicians as well, family practice, other cardiologists, and we watch a manipulation and say, let's say somebody decides to increase a statin drug to drive down ApoB. That's one idea. But when I see then the oxidized phospholipid ApoB go up, even as the ApoB goes down, and then I intervene. Can I ask you a question on that? Because that's so important what you just pointed out. If their ApoB goes down, but their oxidized level goes up, and they have less heart attacks. Do you care? They don't have less heart attacks. But we do. We have the heart end data to show We have tons of, of data that they have They less don't heart. have more, less heart attacks. I mean, for instance, you brought up beta blockers. The most recent recommendations are we should not be using beta blockers as a treatment for coronary artery disease. No, for hypertension. We, uh, no, yeah, so, for, so... As first line for hypertension. Yeah, and so for... and Exactly. And um, for coronary artery disease, we no longer... Uh, put people standardly on beta blockers if they haven't had an MI within, you know, exactly. that time period. And yet that was standard of care. Right, right. But, but the so, reason it changed was because human models showed it to be that That's exactly way. right. But the human models initially made beta blocker therapy after an MI or after a stand sure. or after a coronary bypass standard of care. And then it changed I why? Could, I couldn't send anyone out of the hospital it, and get dinged from Medicare if I didn't put them on a beta blocker, Agreed, right? but similarly, human trials is, are why, you know, initially we didn't recommend beta blockers in heart failure, right? It was believed to be, the right. mechanisms were believed to be, this is gonna be so dangerous for heart failure, et cetera. And now it's the standard of guideline-directed medical therapy for systolic heart failure with the um, quadruple therapy for GDMT. And so it's so important, this is why, you know, the multiple levels of evidence, why preclinical data is important to generate ideas, but then testing it in human outcomes. And so I'm not saying that people shouldn't be um, researching oxidized lipoprotein. So I am a huge fan of lipids. I, I very much am a very lipid focused physician and lipid science. And Thomas Dayspring, who's like a world renowned lipidologist is one of my mentors. And I have huge respect for the research going on in that space. But the thing is, is that we already know with regards to, you know, across the cardiovascular disease field and across every major medical organization um, worldwide that reducing ApoB lowers your risk of cardiovascular disease. And so although these other biomarkers are interesting, you know, we don't have the correlation, the, the hard outcome data that we have with lowering ApoB. Also, the assays vary depending on 
which labs you're looking at, which we could really get into the weeds of it, but there's plenty of people who believe that the assays that are even evaluating those markers aren't even correct. So there's not even a lot of validity in a lot of the advanced lipid testing, um, you know, that that is exciting to talk about in theory, but for clinical utility, you know, I believe with evidence-based medicine, we have to use the best available of evidence to date. And that includes looking at a variety level of evidence, especially most importantly, randomized controlled trials with hard outcomes to give our patients the option to do things that are best for them that we have the best outcome data for. To summarize your positions for people watching, it seems like the, the, the reason you make the decision to treat in the way that you're treating your patients is you're seeing good outcomes in your patients. You are finding this mechanistic approach uh, that makes very logical sense and you could follow it along a pathway. I can track it. Yeah. And you could track it with your patients. And um, Dr. Bellardo is using um, sort of hard endpoints of heart disease, stroke for lowering ApoB. My question is, I have plenty of doctors that I've ended up having to treat patients after they've fallen out of their care that have made you know, wild recommendations that you would firmly disagree with that say you should only eat beef or some very hard, hard carnivore stance type diet. And they claim the same improvements with their patients. So how do I distinguish as a family medicine doctor between your recommendations that are lacking this hard endpoint data versus the carnivore diets? So I can anecdotes. have a patient on a carnivore diet and I have a number of patients who choose to do a carnivore diet. I'll have patients that will do an elimination diet um, to treat their leaky gut. And at the end of the day, at three months, six months, we begin to see their inflammatory markers go up. We see their PLA2 markers go up. We see their HSCRP markers go up. We see their IL-6 go up. And so, and TNF-alpha go up. And so we'll say, hey guys, you know, look, you may feel really good and Here's, here's what's happening you know, underneath the surface. It's like you know the girl in Jaws swimming at the top of the ocean doesn't realize a great white's underneath her. When they see that, they go, ooh, um, okay, you got my attention now. They don't feel it yet. In fact, a lot of them feel really good. So there, there's also, you know, there's this entire group of a sect of the dietary tribes. There's a whole food, plant-based, no oil group, right? And um, I personally, I happen to be vegan. I believe that you don't have to be vegan. Um, I, you only should be vegan for ethical reasons. She's actually been canceled by vegans, so. Yes, because I, um, the, the whole food plant-based no oil individuals, vegans, um, don't necessarily like my viewpoint because I believe olive oil is incredibly healthy. Why? Because of a lot of our hard outcome evidence. Yeah. Um, anyway, but the, the, the low fat whole food plant-based vegans actually, who believe olive oil is toxic, they have the exact same claims as you, identical. They reverse autoimmune disease. They claim to reverse heart disease, which I've gone up against quite a lot of them in debates. They claim to um, reverse every sort of disease, um, inflammation. They lower um, high-risk CRP on these incredibly high lectin, no olive oil diets, and they claim that olive oil is incredibly toxic and they can cite a thousand endothelial studies that will tell you olive oil is toxic. And my argument against that is that when you look at the multiple levels of evidence and you look at the randomized controlled trials, we know that olive oil is not harmful. It's actually beneficial and it's helpful. But I think that one of the points Mike and I had discussed as well is that for, you know, when you are a consumer of this information and our patients who are listening, well, do I follow these low-fat plant-based people or do I follow, you know, because they have just as many anecdotes as, as you have. And so how do we sort out and differentiate the evidence? And this is where my belief is the evidence is looking at evidence-based medicine, looking at the hierarchy of evidence, looking at meta-analysis, and then looking at systematic reviews, and then looking at randomized controlled trials, and then being able to synthesize that into our dietary recommendations, which are eating a diet filled with fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, lean protein, fatty fish, olive oils, great, you know, um, higher in polyunsaturated fat. Because otherwise, if we're just going anecdote to anecdote, then we really have a lot of different dietary tribes making the exact same claims. And everyone has really believable stories. And it's really, I totally understand. And it's moving. I've seen patients improve, even though I'm vegan, I've seen patients improve drastically on a carnivore diet, you know? 
Um, because in many ways, it's a elimination diet. Of course, carnivore diet, I highly recommend against because it can raise your risk for colorectal cancer and heart disease and raises ApoB and they're missing out on lots of vitamins, minerals, and important things. But that being said, you know, we can see the, the carnivore group has tons of anecdotes where they can reverse X, Y, or Z disease. And so I think that's where it's tricky for the general consumer of the dietary information is how do they sort out whose anecdotes are best? And then, which is why, you know, anecdotes are the lowest form of evidence. And we have to kind of go by the looking at all the levels from long ranging epidemiology to randomized control trials and free living studies that are over two years, like the Leon Hart study, mm-hmm. or like studies that are looking at two weeks metabolic ward, highly controlled by my friend, Kevin Hall at the NIH. So we have multiple levels of evidence to synthesize that, that come to our guidelines. Otherwise it's, it can be confusing for the consumer. Do you agree with that, that we need multiple layers of evidence and not anecdotal mechanism? Oh, only? absolutely. So what, uh, what's your takeaway about the evidence that Dr. Bellardo uses for her guidelines? Do you think the evidence is wrong? Do you think it's incorrect? Do you think it's incomplete? I think it's incomplete. Let's put it that way. How for, so? for instance, um, and I've talked about this in the plant paradox, the potential reason why a low fat diet is effective in those believers is that you no longer have a mechanism for lipopolysaccharides to ride on chylomicrons through the wall of the gut and create inflammation. And I love the lipopolysaccharide theory of inflammation. And if you do not have fat carrying fat across the wall of the gut, unless you have leaky gut from other causes, lectins, uh, then you're not going to have LPSs get into circulation. But those low-fat, plant-based, no-oil group, which I don't endorse, I love olive oil. Nor do I. But but, but, of course, that's why I'm saying, (laughs) because I know you're a huge, we agree on olive oil. We think olive oil is great. And so what I'm saying is that they believe, you know, they're on high, high, high lectin diets with the exact same results as you. So I think what we're we're saying is that how do you differentiate that, which is why I think the levels. Well, and I treat a lot of Ornish failures, Esselstyn failures, uh, who have progressive coronary artery disease on those programs. And I'm sure they have Gundry failures that they see. Exactly. So how do I then decide what I should do? What should I teach my residents to do? So for instance, I don't have, I think the best controlled trial of a low fat diet versus a high fat diet was the Leon Hart diet. I think it was very well designed. It's my favorite study. Yeah. I'm glad you said that. Yeah. Because yeah. the Leon Hart study has a statistically significant increase in, so the Leon Hart diet, for your listeners who aren't familiar, one of the best randomized controlled trials, we cite it in all of our guidelines, where they looked at people, they randomized them to, they were on a, a baseline diet, and then they um, randomized them to a diet that increased legumes, statistically significant increase, a drastic increase in legumes increase in whole grains, a decrease in saturated fat, increase in polyunsaturated fat. So pretty much everything we recommend in our latest cardiology recommendations in our nutrition um, statement for the ASPC is in the Leon Hart study. So you increase beans, you increase whole grains. And what did they find in Leon Hart study? Within a year of the study, and I believe it was a four-year they stopped this, study. It was they five-year to, study. They stopped, they stopped it at three it years. Wow. Because they had... Uh, 50 to 70% reduction in cardiovascular disease risk. And so that was actually one New of the events. questions. Uh, yeah, wow. and, and everything in events, in heart outcomes of events, yeah. heart attack, stroke, major. And so I was going to ask you, with them, you know, quadrupling their lectin intake, what is your counter to how some, a study like oh, that? Oh, that's would, easy. Yeah. It turns out the only, th- what she's not mentioning is that the study group, they were compared to a low-fat American Heart Association, low-fat diet. It wasn't a low-fat diet, the, the, the it, original But moment. it was the- So they actually just replaced, so they replaced they, the saturated fat with poly, yeah, but they, it wasn't low-fat. They low replaced fat. it with basically rapeseed oil, which is, quote, canola oil. It's incredibly high in alpha-linolenic acid, which is a short-chain omega-3 fat. What's fascinating is when the researchers broke down every possible change, what the factor was that made the difference, the only one was the blood level of alpha-linolenic acid predicted the outcome. And I write a lot about that in my previous books. I go back into it in Gut Check. 
it's the alpha linolenic acid that is actually making the difference. So I would highly disagree. Oh, uh, it's uh, published because, data. Go no, ahead, look I it mean, up. Because they also, it's a similar. There was multiple variables that but were But that's impacted. the only one that impacted it. No, because... But how it, can you decide that? Because that was the only difference between the two groups. No, is that true? No, because uh, they, they also had, they had uh, the, uh, the, the Leonhardt... Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the Leonhardt group, the, the intervention group also had higher antioxidant intake because they had higher fruits and veg vegetable intake. That's they true, but they, those were all compensated for in the final analysis, and it was only, it surprised me, it was so, only alpha linolenic acid. So I, I had a feeling you were going to say that the um, the polyunsaturated fat intake, which I'm a huge fan, biggest fan of polyunsaturated fat. I mean, I love that. I love canola oil, big fan of canola oil as well. Organic canola oil. But, <laughs> but, um, but there were a multitude of factors that improved the outcomes. And uh, so your so your theory is then that the polyunsaturated fat intake makes up for the lectins. That's yeah, absolutely. Because polyunsaturated fats, alpha linolenic acid actually prevents, lowers LPS levels. Okay, so let's work off that theory because I think that's very valuable. There's a whole list of your, in your books of foods that you say don't eat, yeah. high in lectins. Some of them are common foods that doctors even label as healthy. Why not, instead of saying, stop eating these foods that are rich in antioxidants, vitamins, minerals, et cetera, and instead tell them to consume these fatty acids that are healthy? As well, protection. I do tell them that. But what I do when most of my patients who I see, about 80% of my patients now are autoimmune patients who are not getting any better despite. Why do you think that is? Uh, well, because for whatever reason, my program, if you follow it, your autoimmune disease 90% of the time will be gone, will be in remission in nine months to a year. So you... So people end so up in my office. Specifically for autoimmune. Correct. What about people who are looking to lose weight, people who have cardiac disease? Are those people in your practice as well? Oh, absolutely. But why is it so f skewed towards the autoimmune? Because, well, if we have... Because I, I, I treat a diverse population and yeah, so I can't get to an 80% autoimmune. We have an epidemic of autoimmune disease in this country. And I, among others, think that all diseases, coronary artery disease, is in fact an autoimmune disease. And so if you fix the underlying problem of autoimmune disease, which I and others happen to think is intestinal permeability, leaky gut, then that autoimmune disease resolves. That's very powerful that you say that because when you say it's a it's the leaky gut that causes the autoimmune disease. And you Correct. say, I think this, I, as a skeptic, because I try not be a cynic, I want to be a healthy skeptic, hear that you think this, and I think it's wonderful, and I think we need to research it more. Well, Alessio Fasano from Harvard not only thinks this, but has done a pretty good job proving this, that all disease comes from a leaky gut. But that's Hippocrates not true. Hippocrates uh, said 2,500 years ago. Yeah, but uh, 2,500 years ago, we would balance the humors and make people vomit and bleed them out. There's a lot of things we did <laughs> in the past. It doesn't mean we should look at that as a guide. So the question is, how do we go from individuals saying this as theory versus to modern practice? Because we can measure these things. But measurement doesn't yield outcomes in every scenario. Sure it does. It doesn't because so I have if, patients if, who if, have if we say, abnormal thyroid levels right. and yet feel perfectly fine. And the second that I try and change them with medication, they develop symptoms. Did I help or hurt this patient? Why would I try to change somebody who's feeling fine? Because their levels are off. As you said, levels are more important. No, no, no. I'm talking about we can measure the degree of intestinal permeability with good blood tests. And we can watch intestinal permeability change and we can watch it heal. You do that with your patients? And exactly. How do you measure intestinal permeability with your patients? So we use vibrant wellness. We use anti-zonulin IgG, anti-actin IgG, and anti-LPS IgG. Are these the food sensitivity tests that, no. that measure IgG? Is this what... Food sensitivity does, but this still looks at intestinal permeability. And this is actually what Alessio Fasano worked out as the way to measure intestinal permeability. Uh, I, I didn't devise the test. Yeah, I, I'm just confused because when I work with gastroenterologists, gastroenterologists teach me, I, I go to some of their meetings. This is not 
the, the only time the concept of leaky gut, and it's not leaky gut syndrome, comes up is in autoimmune diseases like celiac disease, where there's actual damage, blunting of villi, immune complex damage. How that's do we get the, from there? That's the tip of the iceberg. Right. So the tip of the iceberg has data behind it, data that we can act upon. Yeah, there's good data behind leaky gut and reversing leaky gut. For instance, I mean, what shocked me when I started looking at this is every one of my patients with coronary artery disease had leaky gut when they walked through the door. Every one of my patients with an autoimmune disease, let's take Hashimoto's, mm -hmm. had leaky gut. Every one of my patients with rheumatoid arthritis, and you know, these are blood markers that we can measure, had leaky gut. So when we put them on a program and remeasure their leaky gut every three months, we can watch it go away and it will resolve. And what's interesting is that the markers will resolve. They will go away. They're, but that's not the interesting part. The interesting part would well, be to treat their away. leaky gut that's what we do. So, for example, in, in gut check, you know, I'm really excited about the microbiome, right? Mm -hmm. there, there holds a lot of untapped potential that we still have a lot of work to do to figure out. And then I've seen on certain podcasts, there's statements that you've mentioned about, you know, if you take the microbiome of a depressed mouse mm -hmm. and you implant that into a happy mouse, the mouse gets depressed. Or True. you mentioned a study where... Um, and I couldn't quite find the study where there was an individual, uh, back in the day when people were institutionalized for their depression, they would give them a colonic and then give them a fecal enema and 66% of them would improve. That was a statement yeah, yeah. That, I, that I've seen you make. Yep. Does, like, what do I do with that information? Because put, put yourself in my shoes for a second. Mm -hmm. I have a patient that comes into my office who's depressed. Mm -hmm. They heard you say that. Mm -hmm. They wonder why I'm not giving them the fecal enema. I wouldn't give them a fecal enema. Why not? You just said you have evidence of 66% cure rate. That's the last thing I would give them. But that, how if you said a study did this? I, back in the 1930s. For so? one thing, believe it or not, when I went to medical school back in the dark ages, we were actually the first people at the Medical College of Georgia to use fecal enemas from medical students to treat C. difficile. We didn't mm -hmm. even know it was C. diff back then. Mm -hmm. It was pseudomembranous enterocolitis. Mm -hmm. And my professor, Arlie Mansberger, said, you know, and this was when broad spectrum antibiotics first came out in the mid-70s. Mm -hmm. He says, you know, I think there's something going on in the gut and we've got to reconstitute the gut. So once a week, medical students took a crap in what we called the honey bucket, mm -hmm. went into Arlie Mansberger's lab, put it in a wearing blender, homogenize it and shoved it up the rear ends of people with pseudomembranous enterocolitis. And it cured it, mm -hmm. cured it. And we went, son of a gun, this is nuts. And we do that now. We do Not that Not to now. that degree, no, correct. but obviously we, we do, do use now. fecal still, transplants. Right. And, right, but we so, don't need to do that. We can reconstitute the microbiome for one thing, we're, we've killed off our microbiome because of all the antibiotics we take. Well, that's why we put it in. All the antibiotics we give our animals and the best, most potent antibiotic there is, is glyphosate, Roundup. It was patented as an antibiotic by Monsanto. And so if you wanted to do a number on your microbiome, we've created the perfect storm for killing off our microbiome. And what's really interesting is glyphosate in particular kills off the tryptophan pathway making bugs that make serotonin. So if you wanted to make someone anxious and depressed, you would kill off that tryptophan pathway of the microbiome. So what you do is you eat organically and you stop taking antibiotics unless there's a life-threatening problem. And the good news is if you stop eating animals, you'll lose those antibiotics. The bad news is that most of our grains are contaminated with glyphosate. My question, I don't think we got the answer here yet because <laughs> I think it's important. When we found that fecal transplants work specifically in the case of C. diff, mm -hmm. but not in the case of depression, Right? I'm you, not you advocating that. Yeah. Correct. Yeah, it just... In fact, I don't know if... 
Maybe over in Europe it's being used for that, but certainly not in the United States because the FDA would not allow it. Yeah, I just don't know what's the use of then stating that study. Because there's chapter after chapter in Gut Check showing the correlation between a diverse microbiome and lack of depression, lack of anxiety. And we're getting closer and closer to understanding which bugs do what. But we're not there yet. We're getting I, close. I mean, we're I have, close, I but we're not. I just want to put that on the record. We're not there yet. Because we question, know a diversity is good. Yeah. But we don't know which ones. We don't know exactly which ones. There's still room to be explored here. Yeah. I mean, for instance, um, there are now bugs that make oxytocin, the love hormone. And you can actually swallow some of these uh, and make more oxytocin. That may be a good thing. Maybe. So I would like to counter that with the fact that, so I think the gut microbiome is fascinating. And I think we're at the you know beginning of, I think if you talk to the world's renowned gut microbiome researchers, they will humbly tell you that we are at the very, very beginning of the of elucidating the answers to the questions of how important. I don't think anyone doubts that the gut microbiome is an important facet of health, but we don't really have those answers yet. And, and I think that that can be the, the most, you know, world-renowned gut microbiome researchers will tell you that, you know, we're not even sure the exact population of and what percentage of what colonies of which bacteria are more beneficial. So we can't even prescribe right now exactly what is most beneficial for the gut microbiome at this time because we don't even know. That's why probiotics, that's why the American College of Gastroenterology, which you'll know this because as a family provider, I'm sure you are asked all the time about probiotics. And this is why the ACG does not recommend probiotic use for people um, generally outside of very few clinical conditions that require it because we don't even know what strains at what doses in which scenario um, are going to be beneficial. And we know that with lots of the probiotic research that it doesn't have benefits and it can have harms and risks, which is why the ACG um, uh, is uh, looks at it that way. And so I think that we're at the infancy of gut microbiome research, and I do agree that it's important, but we don't have enough of that hard outcome data yet to give us, you should be you know, eating this exact kind of food to improve your gut microbiome. I think that in general, you know, most of the things with a healthy dietary, eating a, a diverse you know, plant predominant diet, of course, we believe can help gut health in general with eating fiber and short chain fatty acids and all of the things that happen in the gut microbiome. But I do think we're at the infancy of that research and not knowing it's not as quite as prescriptive yet, which is why the probiotic trials have failed. Um, and why we don't, we recommend probiotics only in very certain small clinical scenarios because we don't fully understand. Um, and there's tons of research to be done in that space. And I also just wanted to counter on glyphosate quickly. Um, uh, organic, when we look at organic versus um, non-organic, and I have no dog in this fight personally, because sometimes I buy organic if it's convenient for me. Sometimes I buy conventional. Um, but I do think it's really important to make this clear to your audience that when we're looking at research with hard outcomes, um, meaning you're looking at cancer risk, you're looking at heart disease risk, the reason why no guidelines that make recommendations for diet, including the American Cancer Society, um, that recommend eating organic is because all of the research with hard outcomes, there's two main studies that looked at it, Bradbury, and I forget the other one, um, they show no difference with organic versus conventional produce. So although the mechanisms and the ideas of glyphosate may be interesting, um, it hasn't borne out to being any difference in outcomes with regards to cancer risk, cardiovascular disease risk, or other hard outcomes that have been evaluated in the cohorts. All that is interesting. Here's my takeaway for me as a primary care doctor. The reason why America is sick, the world is sick, we have an obesity epidemic, we have people consuming ultra-processed foods at rates unheard of. Um, my patients overeat ultra-processed foods, they eat tons of unnecessary added sugars, and as a result, they're very sick. Cardiovascular disease, strokes, diabetes, et cetera. None of my patients are overeating fruits. And yet, within your book and your podcast, you make fruits almost an enemy. <laughs> They're not an enemy. They should be our friend when mm -hmm. they would have been available. 
No great ape eats fruit all year round. They eat in season. And great apes actually only gain weight during fruit season. And we don't... We'll take a trip to the Central Park Zoo. But let's why do we at, need to go to the Central Park Zoo? Let's look None at all of the my cages. patients overeat fruits. Why are we talking about that? There's no juicers in the Central Park Zoo. <laughs> but do you feel like generally... <laughs> Across the United States, fruit consumption is an issue? No, fruit products are an issue. Totally different. What's a fruit product? Like apple juice. Agreed. Like orange juice. Agreed. Yeah, we're not but we, have, we agree yeah. with that. But we're not talking fruit. about juice. But well, that's not what we're talking about. We're, you're saying an apple is not ideal to eat. You said grapes are sugar bombs that are they problematic. They are sugar bombs. There's as but much that sugar mean that, in a cup of grapes as in a Hershey's candy bar. Yeah, but that requires nuance. <laughs> because I would never tell a, a child to eat Hershey bar over a grape. That will never happen in my practice. No, Would you but recommend you that? might allow the mother to give them apple juice as their but I would, drink. That's not, we're not talking about apple juice, we're saying grapes. Right. It just, it's, it's a child hears, a mother hears, grapes are a sugar bomb, might as well give them Hershey's. They will give them Hershey's. <laughs> might as well. And your example- But with why apes? might as well? Don't you think <laughs> grapes have more nutrients than Hershey's? Well, believe it or not, extra dark chocolate has some of the highest polyphenol content. But around. we're talking about milk chocolate. Yeah, I, I wouldn't give anyone milk chocolate. <laughs> exactly. So why even bring the comparison? You have great animated examples, Dr. Gundry. I, I, it's, they're quite, I, I, I appreciate you. There's just, textbooks written about I, great apes and fruit. But I will say, I, I, I believe you. But what's interesting <laughs> is that because in this modern day and age, we don't the, actually do need to look- the guidelines, how much did you guys take into consideration we, grade ape diets? We, we zero consider <laughs> grade apes because the, the good news is, is that we have multiple ev levels of evidence that have, look at fruit intake in humans, like in actual human species. So we don't need to look at grade apes for- to help us indicate how much fruit is healthy. And if you look at the epidemiological data over time, I mean, it is without question that um, individuals who are in the higher tertiles of fruit consumption are always, always, always associated with lower risks of cardiovascular disease, autoimmune disease, cancers um, in human beings. So, you know, although the great ape theory is is great, but there's, we're not apes, you know? So as- So you humans, think fructose is good for us? I think That's that- That's what I'm hearing. <laughs> well, I- I'm saying that I don't recommend apple juice. And I actually think that all major medical organizations do not, actually in, in cardiology guidelines, we do not recommend sugar sweetened beverages. And apple juice is not beneficial, neither is orange juice. Um, but fruit in its whole Phew, form- thank goodness. Yeah, fruit in its whole form, you know, comes with a lot of other things besides just glucose, fructose. fructose. It comes with, you know- um, Polyphenols. Polyphenols, Fine. vitamins, minerals, fiber, things that are really healthy for us. And so, um, you know, the comparison of fruit to, um, you know, a candy bar is just a little disingenuous. And I do think that the ape example, while it's interesting, we have so much human data we can look at that shows us how beneficial and healthful fruit can be. And I'm not saying everyone needs to eat a ton of fruit. I'm not here recommending a fruitarian diet by any means. But, you know, we do know that, uh, like, as Mike mentioned, that you know, the vast majority of our patients who are having difficulty with diet, it's it's not from a banana overdose. It's not from eating too many grapes. You know, I think that we can all agree, at least all three of us, I think, can be on the same page here that the major problems with diet in our current time, a lot of it has to do with these hyper palatable processed foods that are super convenient and, you know, ubiquitous in society. Yeah, Dr. Gundry, I think what we're pointing out is we're on the same page with being anti-processed foods. We're pro-olive oil, pro-Mediterranean diet. We're all on the same page here. The issue is that folks are overeating these uh, over-processed foods. They're not consuming enough fruits and vegetables. The Leon Hart study showed that if you increase legumes and whole grains, and your major stance in your books is remove whole grains, limit legumes, fruits are your enemy. How? So, whoa. I eat beans multiple times per week, <laughs> as long as they're pressure cooked. I think ancient societies always fermented their legumes. When you, f when you put beans in a pot, you soak them for 24 hours. You ever notice the scum coming to the top? But who's advocating That's, to eat raw beans here? Well, nobody, but regular cooked beans, you have not destroyed the lectins. That's well proven. Fermentation will destroy them. And yet Pressure when these people in the own heart study ate those 
non-fermented beans. They, they did great. If they you cook, were, if you cook they beans, they were fermented. You're no, not hearing if, no, me. No, no. If you cook beans appropriately, like even in a pot, you can remove like 95 plus percent of the lectins. And I, I, I agree. None of us are advocating for raw beans, but cooked beans, and also by the way, canned beans. Huge fan for anyone listening that wants something convenient. Canned beans, as long as there's no sodium, wash them. They're already pre-cooked and the lectins are minimized. And only two companies that pressure cook their canned beans, Eden Brand and Jovial. Now, I'm not a consultant to either of them, so but it's so the, easy. The, the problem in our society is people aren't eating whole foods. And here we are making a list of whole foods they should avoid. I'm not telling them to avoid them. Whole grains... If you have millet and sorghum, which do not have a hull, they're perfectly safe. But you can even eat these in excess. And let's get you back You can eat to anything fruit. in excess. Let's you never have enough fruit. carrots, you let's turn orange. Let's get back to a fruit for a second. I can watch my patients you know, go to Costco and load up on the grapes or the blueberries, and I can watch their triglycerides go up. And you might agree with me that the triglyceride to HDL ratio might be very useful. Actually, so in cardiology, we no longer uh, focus on triglycerides to HDL ratio because now um, we know that the most important prognostic factor is ApoB. So the cheat sheet way for that is looking at your non-HDL cholesterol. Triglycerides incredibly important, but triglycerides are only a temporary um, measure. Yeah, and, two, and, three days. And yeah. Exactly. And so the, we actually don't look at your triglyceride HDL ratio anymore as a... Um, as a, uh, well, it has triglycerides go up. In general, your apple B right. will go up. But you, well, yes, for right? sure. But yeah. your the HDL ratio, not not right. a super huge part. But fruit, actually, you you will know this, Dr. Gundry. All the research shows us that people who eat higher amounts of fruit actually have a significantly lower hypo, um, ApoB in all randomized control trials across the board due to dietary fiber and low saturated fat content. So actually eating tons of fruit, um, especially not in the form of fruit juice, fruit in terms of whole fruits can actually reduce ApoB significantly and cardiovascular risk subsequently. Uh, all of this is valuable, but why are we arguing about fruit when it's not the enemy? <laughs> the enemy is people thinking that fruit, it, it, we should not have 365 days of endless summer. But if, who is overeating fruit? Uh, the, we, Americans are overeating Ultra processed foods. Americans are totally eating burgers, hot dogs. Totally agree with that. I what, can't get my patients to eat fruit. What research shows us that people shouldn't be eating fruit? When I when I just mentioned that every um, like if you look at NHANES data, if I'm, you look at we, I'm not saying study, don't eat fruit. I'm right. saying eat fruit in season. But, but, yeah, right, that's but I'm what trying, she's I'm trying to ask you. I'm trying to ask you. There, there's no fruit is not that, available year round. There's no normally. research that shows us that fruit has to be eaten in season for it to be healthful. All of the research shows us that in a dose dependent manner, people who eat more fruit in the highest fertiles of consumption of fruit, um, people who eat a varied diet of fruits and vegetables and whole grains and all these things have every mar marker of lower disease risk, whether it's cardiovascular disease risk, obesity, weight control, diabetes. And so my question to you is, is Besides the seasonality you're discussing with regards to apes, which we are not, when we have all this human outcome data showing us that there is no seasonality to fruit consumption, it's just eating a varied plant-predominant diet that's most helpful, how do you make that leap from animals to when we have all this human data showing the opposite of what you're saying? So in the Mediterranean, people do eat fruit seasonally. People but eat forget fruit year-round in the Mediterranean okay. as well. Do you not respect the research that Dr. Bellardo is pointing out saying that People who eat fruits in the highest amounts have lower risk factors and better outcomes. Because they're following people primarily in the Mediterranean and they do. But that's no, not no, true. No, 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 the NHANES, I'm talking yeah, about the major NHANES, cohort yeah, data is in the know. United States. That's the nurses' health study. Right. We're talking about the um, physicians' study. Like all of these cohorts are in the United States. So, and even in the Mediterranean, I mean, we live in a modern society now where fruit is accessible most people in modern society year round and a lot of people are not eating seasonally. So, right. you know, the seasonal the seasonal idea, I think, you know, based on the animal studies and thing, although an interesting thought, it doesn't bear out in human outcome data, which shows us that you can eat he fruit healthfully year round without, with not only without there being no adverse events in any at least cardiovascular disease or all cause mortality or cancer research, you know, but there's a multitude of benefits of a higher amount of fruit consumption. And I'm not telling anyone to eat all fruit all day, every day, but um, there is no reason for it to be limited seasonality. And the reason why also I think is really important too, 
is there's a reason why the um, American Cancer Society guidelines, the American College of Cardiology guidelines, our um, um, ASPC guidelines are all for nutrition that are very similar, as well as the Endocrine Society guidelines. All of the guidelines to prevent cancer, to prevent diabetes, to prevent cardiovascular disease, all of the recommendations for nutrition are similar because the science is similar. So eating a diet with varied fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, lean proteins, fish, things like that, have proven to reduce the risk of the variety of diseases, which is why we have so much synergy across the various specialties. As a spectator of listening to two experts speak, Dr. Gundry, your reason for not recommending fruit year-round, you reference apes. She references longitudinal studies here in the United States. How can I possibly side with you? Uh, come to my clinic and watch what happens. But when somebody... every, a lot of people can do so that. I have nothing against fruit. Maybe you don't <laughs> hear me. Fruit, I, I need to read some of your statements. Fruit like in season is great. But fruit contains polyphenols. They're one of the best ways to get polyphenols in the diet. In fact, what I recommend is reverse juicing. Go buy all your organic fruit, put it in a juicer, throw the juice away, take the pulp, and put it in plain coconut well, I yogurt. I love fiber. I'll there second you go. Me that. Fiber's well, it's great. Polyphenol. On yeah. Lewis Howe's podcast. Oh, this is a I quote love from that. You. Yes. Apples are horrible for you. Yeah, they are. I mean, why? Because an apple is not an apple anymore. And in fact, on but Instagram, that's not true. It's not an apple anymore. Yes, it's, been, it's bigger. It's been it's as big hybridized as a grapefruit. for sugar. Yes. But it has high so, fiber content, it has polyphenols, it, all the things you just said are healthy. Phytonutrients. It doesn't anymore. But it yes, does. It does. No, it's been totally it, changed. It's been maybe. It has less vitamin C than 50 years. But it still it has, has vitamin C. It has a little bit. So, so how get can a you small say, apple. But how can you say apples are horrible from you from that deduction? From <gasps> that big grapefruit size apple. Yes. Correct. And then when we look at research of people who consume apples, they live great lives. My patients who are unhealthy yeah. don't eat apples. When they eat an apple that's the right size, and guess what? Apples are not available year round. Normally. Again, all back those in statements, the old days, you can stand behind that apples are different, that apples yeah. are not the same size, that they're not, shouldn't be available year round. And these How studies, does that bring you to the deduction of apples are horrible for you? Apples in this size you are said a not fruit great. smoothie is the worst possible thing you can do for your mitochondria i think that's true you it's don't think cyanide is worse for your mitochondria that blocks oxygen and kills it well you're not going to eat cyanide unless you eat the apple uh, exactly so how can fruit smoothie a be the fruit worst smoothie thing? is a pure fructose bomb and if well, you it's want not to pure fructose, if, i'll argue that you on that because when a you little smooth, bit of glucose so when you smoothie by the way, when you make a smoothie, the reason why I think smoothies can be beneficial, not for weight management, because you know, often drinking your calories can be not super uh, helpful. But um, in general, why smoothies are helpful is that when you blend, this is why I'm anti-juicing pro smoothie, when you actually blend a fruit, vegetable, et cetera, to put it in a smoothie, you actually preserve the fiber matrix. And Correct. so the fiber remains in the smoothie. So when you're blending a blackberry, raspberry, apple smoothie, you're getting tons of fiber, tons of phytonutrients, tons of amazing healthful benefits. Um, the only uh, downfall, I would say, in my opinion, is that for weight management, maybe you're not gonna get as much satiety as you would chewing it, but that's an entirely different discussion. But um, I did have to you know, step in with the smoothie, defend, give smoothies a little defense because you do maintain, the research shows you do maintain the fiber matrix when you do a smoothie. Now, juicing on the other hand, not beneficial because you're removing the important parts of the fiber in the pulp. We all agree on that. Yeah. I wanna read you a statement and you tell me if you agree. Dr. Gundry states, my research along with the research of others has shown that year-round fruit consumption is associated with kidney damage and diabetes among other diseases. So not only is this um, not, does not bore out at, at all in human data, it doesn't even, um, we have multiple level, levels of evidence of research that uh, disagree with this drastically. So you could start with the EPI research, as I mentioned. So prospective cohort research is where you're observing someone over years and years in time. You're looking 20, 30 years, you're evaluating someone's dietary intake. And you know that is only one level of evidence, right? You can't make every decision off of nutrition epidemiology. In that one area and level of evidence, we see, as I mentioned, in the higher tertiles of consumption of fruits, people have less diabetes. This is very well known, less heart disease, less cancer risk. 
et cetera. Then you look at the randomized controlled trials. There's numerous randomized controlled trials that when you replace um, a standard American diet for a diet that's higher in fruits, vegetables, and uh, fruit included in that variety of fruits, we know we can reduce diabetes risk, heart disease risk, cancer risk, et cetera, in shorter term randomized controlled trials. Even my friend Kevin Hall at the NIH did a, you want to go to even more meticulously controlled trial. You look at Kevin Hall's study at the NIH where people went to live in the metabolic ward at the NIH in two weeks, and he did a really low-fat plant-based, and I'm not even a huge proponent for low-fat by any means. Um, I think there's multiple different um, dietary compositions that can work for people. But he looked at a low-fat, 100% plant-based diet, high, tons of fruits, tons of lectins, versus a um, a high Fat, animal ketogenic based, diet. Ketogenic diet. I know the study. And you know, and he found that when he tightly controlled over two weeks, they lived at the NIH. Every molecule that they ate was measured, you know, evaluated, and you know, everything improved in the low fat arm drastically compared to the keto arm. Um, and it was because they were eating more fruits, vegetables, and whole grains, and you know, foods like that. So, I think that we have multiple levels of evidence that show us fruit is healthy. And I think that I think the point you're trying to make is that. You know, we have bigger fish to fry in the world of unhealthy eating than fruit being the issue. And I think that, unfortunately, I think that discouraging people against eating fruit can give people the mixed message that they're, you know, that a food that's healthful for them may not be as beneficial. And then they may even find something that's even less healthy to stick with. Do you think that that could be a reasonable thing a person can deduct? Uh, first of all, if I have somebody with kidney failure, and they have an elevated uric acid, the first thing I do is modulate their fruit intake. Why not meat intake, given that? Modulate their meat intake. Yeah. You, you forget, <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of anti-meat. <laughs> um, we, well, I'm not, I'm not necessarily anti -meat. Well, you're not anti-meat either. You, you I am talk, very much so. But yeah. you said small amounts of meat. Is small amounts, but- I agree, small amounts. That's why I'm saying you guys are- I agree, small amounts of meat yeah, too. I'm, I've been going after new 5GC now for a very long time, and there's more evidence that scares me to death about new 5GC. But back to fruit. So uric acid, I think we would agree fructose is a big driver of uric acid. Wow. Fructose. Uh, animal proteins, particularly fish and shellfish, will drive uric acid. Anyhow, in my patient population, and I'm talking about my patients, that I do their blood work every three months when I reduce their fruit intake, look for other sources of fructose in their diet, high fructose, corn syrup, et cetera. We see their uric acid fall and we see their cystatin C and EGFR based on cystatin C rise. There, and that to me, and then if we change and allow their uric acid to come back, it'll go the exact opposite way. How do we generalize what you are doing with the select population of David patients? David Perlmutter said, did the same thing. He even, even wrote a book about it, you know, drop acid. Um, I'm not as strong a proponent of Drop dropping, acid. Yeah, cute book, cute, cute name. <laughs> uh, only uh, boomers get the joke. <laughs> it's called um, drop acid. But like all of these things are individual cases versus generalized advice. This is generalized advice I give to a patient who I see with renal failure wanting to stay off But of when dialysis. you write your book, your book is not targeted to people right, with so renal the, failure. Yeah, no, well, even but, people with renal failure, by the way, I just step in and jump in. So even if people with renal failure very much can eat fruit, there's actually no limitation. I mean, people with renal failure, failure may have specific dietary potassium or protein restrictions um, at hand. But in general, we know that all of the cohort data and the RCT data shows that people are less likely to develop renal failure if they eat a diet with a variety of fruits and vegetables and whole grains and legumes. So I think the issue is, is that Dr. Gundry, going back to kind of like the other dietary group, like the low fat plant-based no olive oil group, I mean, they will say that they can reverse kidney disease on their exact cohort. I mean, if you had Dr. Esselstyn sitting here, yeah. you know, he'd be saying that he revert every single disease you say you reverse with your dietary plan, he will say he does on a high lectin, zero olive oil diet. And I'm here in the middle saying that there's a variety of different dietary paradigms that can be health healthful, but where we have to get that evidence can't be from an individual cohort. It has to be from a variety of uh, levels of evidence in order to inform our decisions because your, you know, anecdotes are 
um, you know, of course they're going to be meaningful to you and his anecdotes are meaningful to him. And we've all seen patients that have improved on a, a variety of different dietary paradigms, but how we inform our patients in the general public has to be based on good sound scientific evidence. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's just, it becomes more confusing when we start picking certain biomarkers to look at and nitpicking certain problems. And then we create this very confusing picture where patients come into my office and say, I no longer eat fruits because I heard this in this on, on Lewis House podcast. And that scares the life out of me because I, every well, patient- Why don't you see what happens to their blood work when they do that? Which well, is what I do. They don't, because they, what they do is they switch off fruits to Milky Ways per your statement. I didn't ever tell anybody to eat a Milky Way. <laughs> you say if you're going to eat grapes, you might as well eat a Milky Way. It was actually a Hershey's candy bar. So if people Milky who eat way, fruit in all of the research, how do you explain that if people who eat more amounts of fruit in all the research have lower APOB, lower weight, lower risk of diabetes, lower um, high-res CRP, like in multitude of evidence, then then how do you explain away it being so dangerous? With just wait, 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 wait. Fruit is one of the best sources for polyphenols. And if you right. want to feed your gut microbiome, it turns out that polyphenols are the best prebiotic there is. But not year-round. Not year-round. Look at why? the Hansas. But you, why the Hansas? I'll give you a perfect example. We want to change our gut microbiome on a seasonal basis based on the food that's being eaten. During the wet season, when the Hadzas just eat fruit and but honey, everyone lives in they different have a world. really interesting, diverse gut microbiome. In the uh, dry season, when all they're eating is meat, their microbiome changes 180 degrees. And I think, and other people think, that that change per seasonal was built in. Perfect. You think it, it's a theory, but how can we generalize this that everyone should follow it from this theory? Because it's a theory. Because that's how we came about. Well, that's how they came about. But well, there's people one, that live- they're one of the last hunter-gatherers well, that then, we Gretchen, can study. If you talk to Herman Ponzer, do you yeah, know who Herman is? Yeah. He's uh, studied the Hadza probably yeah. more than any individual. He's a good friend of mine. I just texted him before our debate today to, to ask him a few questions. You know, if you talk to Herman about it, you know, he would never advocate for seasonal only fruit eating because, you know, the evidence doesn't support that. And he studies the Hadza in great detail because, you know, the Hadza eat the way they do because they are a hunter-gathering right. population. They're stuck. And they we have so much to learn from them. Um, but we live in the United States where things are ubiquitous and available. And we, we have data that looks at people who eat for year-round and shows positive outcomes for every cardio, I mean, for diabetes, for hypertension, for weight, for inflammation, for cancer risk. So- That's it, because of the polyphenols. Right, so I feel like we are circling a bit because- yeah. So it sounds like you agree so that there's fruits a whole are good lot for you of, because of polyphenols. Right, there's a whole lot easier ways to get polyphenols than eating fruit, which is my point. I think what's the whole lot I easier think, way? I think fructose is a mitochondrial poison. Do you think it's more and beneficial to take your polyphenol um, supplements than it is to eat whole fruit? Uh, depends on the season. For instance, I had a cute little apple a couple of days ago that I got at the Santa Barbara far Farmers Market. Four bites, and the apple was gone. Do you think our disease epidemic, our chronic disease epidemic, our, our disease, our cardiovascular disease, our diabetes epidemic, the cancer risk, the autoimmune disease, do you think fruit is an issue there or do you think that it has to do with everything else? I mean, because well, I don't I don't I, think that it's- It's our highly processed food among other right, things. Right, agreed. But a lot of our highly processed food is loaded with fructose. But that's, but that's not that's fruit. That's different than fruit. I'm just saying fructose is a problem and please, Correct me if you think fructose is good for you. It's not about thinking of fructose. I don't want to take apart an ingredient and villainize the ingredient because that's not helpful in real life. If I start villainizing individual ingredients, I can't give my patients good guidance that is universally valuable. It's the same way that any restrictive diet, if you restrict patients to eating toilet paper, they'll lose weight, but it doesn't mean they have a nutritious diet. So when I tell someone fructose is bad for you, they can get fructose from a Hershey's candy bar or a grape. I'd much rather they get it from a grape. 
And fructose can be turned into glucose and the brain works off glucose. And yet too much glucose is a problem. Inflammation can be a very big problem in the intestinal area causing permeability. We know this, you say this quite often. Right. But inflammation could also be a wonderful thing. When we exercise, we have spikes in blood sugar, we have spikes in inflammation. So to generalize saying fructose is terrible is not a valuable thing to the general public. Do you see what I'm saying with that? Yeah, but the problem is fructose is now ubiquitous in our diet. And the more we can identify where it's hiding, then the better off we all and are. And your proposed statement is that it's in hiding in all these fruits people are consuming. All these large fruits out of season, yeah. But no one's eating fruits. None of my patients- You can't possibly fruit. think that- I live you in California. We, we eat fruit in California, sorry. But in America, <laughs> we talk about it. How much fruit is in the American standard diet? It depends on where you live. No, I'm asking about the American standard diet. When very, we eat- Very little. So then why are we talking about it? Because, <laughs> and even, I'll give you another example. Joseph Mercola recently has gone a, kind of on a high fruit kick, and which- is hilarious because he was one of the original high fat guys. And he says, man, I feel so much better. All I do is eat fruit all day long. I mean, I don't care what but, someone says. Wait a minute. And then he says, hey, but wait a minute. I notice that when I'm really going crazy on fruit, my triglycerides start going through the roof and my insulin starts going through the roof and uh, you gotta be careful. Well, that's also, listen, that's also not a randomized controlled trial where you're controlling calories, that. right? Because I just you, don't know what to do with you, that because you, it's not generalizable what Dr. McCullough does or doesn't do with his insulin. It's not a controlled feeding study where you're looking at, of course, if you're increasing calories and you're increasing, you're going to make shifts in lipoproteins and you're going to see right. a variety of shifts. But overall, on balance, when we look at all of the data, we know the people who eat, I just don't want your listeners to be confused that when we look at all of the research, the totality of evidence, people who eat more higher amounts of fruit consumption on balance have a much lower risk of obesity, diabetes, hypertension. And then, you know, I don't think you can honestly sit here and think that fruit is the major problem of our obesity epidemic or our disease epidemic. You know, it's it it's just, it's... It Dr. Gondry, I'll simplify it to a metaphor. It's like we're sitting here and we're saying evidence shows eating carrots is healthy and carrots are a health food. And you sit here and you say, but if you eat enough of them, you'll turn orange. No one's debating that. Yeah. Carrots, but are, it's, but carrots it's, are really good for you. Yeah, I know. But you see how I'm saying that we say that in general, this food is healthy. Fruits are healthy year round. And you say, but in some instances, fruits can be bad. Yeah, great. But what, why say that? Because if fruits are picked out of season, they're picked uh, unripe and they are actually loaded with lectins. And then we ripen them when they arrive here. Are there any times lectins are good for you? Oh yeah, there's a couple nice, really good lectins. So why are we generalizing lectins to be terrible? Uh, because most of them are part of the plant defense system against being eaten. But there's and many we, of them that are we being researched used, for good things. We used to have a great defense system against lectins in our microbiome. There are bugs that enjoy eating gluten. Most people, they're gone, unfortunately. There are bugs that eat oxalate. And interestingly enough, people who have oxalate kidney stones or who are oxalate sensitive, they don't have those oxalate bacteria, eating bacteria in their gut microbiome. If you refoster those guys, the oxalates don't become a problem anymore. So again, I guess we're circling back around, the gut microbiome, which has been def decimated by everything we've done, is part and parcel of all this. And getting back to the Hanzas, I think the idea that maybe we should have shifts in our microbiome on a seasonal basis is built into our evolutionary fiber. That's a fair theory. Okay. But we have to be humble enough to say it's a theory. Yeah, didn't, okay. say, didn't say it's proven. That, that's, that's great. Then would you say that you in general villainize lectins? In general, yeah, in our American diet. So do you see the problem with simplifying something as all good or all bad in healthcare, how it could become a problem? I started doing this because I asked patients to eliminate certain foods out of their diet 
and let me see what happens to their blood work. And then, let me see what happens to their intestinal permeability. Did that, did, when you were a heart surgeon or practicing as a heart surgeon, because you still are a heart surgeon, did you make those recommendations to eat fruits, vegetables, all those things? Yeah. And what do you think the reason for the failure of those patients' diets leading to them coming back every few years was? Was it A, the fact that they couldn't stick to it or they didn't stick to it or they couldn't afford it or the fact that they ate fruits and vegetables and still got sick? Um, well, there's a new paper out just this past week looking at, a um, basically a vegan diet versus a uh, well proportioned. Chris Gardner's. Yeah. I just read it. And it turns out the vegan diet did wonderful things in terms of cholesterol markers, inflammatory markers. The other diet did well, but not anything as good as the vegan diet, right? Mm -hmm. What's interesting, if you actually, if you read the paper, is they go, yeah, this is all true, but the compliance with the vegan diet is so difficult mm -hmm. that it's unsustainable. And the compliance behind your yes and no list is easier. It's actually much easier. 90% of my patients follow that list. But that doesn't- There's a little select selection yeah. bias there. Well, they're, inter they're interested. <laughs> That's like saying my followers because, watch 90% of my be, videos. Be, well, they're my followers, because, yeah. Because if they see, if their autoimmune disease goes away, they're really interested. Or they support what you do. And they don't they're going to. What, what do you mean? They're your patients. My yeah, followers watch my videos they because they've selected to subscribe to they me. They wouldn't be my patients if they didn't see a change in their autoimmune disease. There's, I'm not saying <laughs> your the recommendations you make about eliminating processed foods is all bad. That's not where our debate comes from. In fact, I, there's so many things you do very well for your patients that lead them to have good outcomes. The danger comes in when we start generalizing as foods as being evil or bad, apples are horrible for you. Those statements mislead patients into making bad decisions because when you say apples are terrible for you, you're making this statement from a very knowledgeable position of the, the polyphenol change, this change, and you wish that they were a little bit smaller. The patient hears, I might as well eat a Hershey's Kiss. Do you get how that happens? Yes. And that's a big problem because your books are bestsellers. But and then patients go, I don't want to eat apples anymore. Great, because the apple they're eating is the wrong apple. That's so hard that to say. That makes me very happy. That's so hard to say. <laughs> What's your takeaway? <laughs> My takeaway is that, um, you know, there's many different dietary patterns that patients can be healthy on. Um, Although there's much research that um, informs our, our recommendations and guidelines, patients have to find what works best for them. And that eating a plant-predominant diet filled with fruits, vegetables, legumes, whole grains, lean protein, you know, there's a reason why I believe there's synergy across all of our major medical society guidelines for cardiology, cancer, endocrine society, uh, et cetera. And um, in reality, there is no one perfect diet. No one food in one dose is going to um, cause disease and that it's really patients finding something that's sustainable and works for them long-term. I'm gonna say something borderline controversial. When we talk about leaky gut syndrome, not the concept of leaky gut, leaky gut syndrome, I feel like patients who have gastrointestinal conditions a lot of times have nonspecific vague symptoms. And our healthcare system is trash at helping those people. True. For many reasons. One, our system is flawed, so doctors don't have enough time to spend with their patients to properly hear them out. Two, we don't have enough research to figure out exactly what's going on so that we don't have every diagnosed disease already on the ICD-10 classification. And then three, so many of these patients then fall into the bucket of seeking an answer elsewhere usually in the form of supplements that are being for sale to them, diets that promise them solutions to their things that are largely unproven. And as a result, those patients, and why I suspect 80% of your patients are autoimmune patients because they've been hurt by our system. But that's not because there's some kind of definitive proof in 
the solution for all autoimmune conditions. It's simply because you're offering them a solution that our healthcare system doesn't have. Oh, that's absolutely true. Most of my patients in the autoimmune spectrum have been to six, eight, 10 different centers, different physicians looking for an answer and not getting it. And that's actually how they end up in my office. Do you, like zooming out, do you find it strange that patients that have a GI disorder, an autoimmune condition, a rheumatologic condition, go to many GI centers, rheumatology centers, don't get helped, but then a cardiothoracic surgeon is helping them? Uh, not anymore because well, I actually... What do you know that the rheumatologists don't know? Uh, quite a bit. What? So for instance, all of this comes from intestinal permeability. How do I know that? Because when the intestinal permeability stops, by whatever mechanism you want to do it, and there are multiple ways, I happen to like my way because it works, when that stops, the, the autoimmune condition goes away. Resolved. And the rheumatologists don't want to help their patients and follow your mantra. They want to believe in the system of using a biologic to treat what is treatable with food. So you're saying a rheumatologist who's went through 15 years of higher education yeah. has such strong faith in other methods of treatments that they refuse to see the very simple solution that you have laid out. Uh, example from the plant paradox, a young lady with Crohn's disease who was taken care of by the head of GI at the Mayo Clinic who believes that Crohn's is, as a genetic component, has some, but not much, went on my program, resolved her Crohn's disease, called her gastroenterologist, said, I'm cured by following this diet. And he says, that's just a bunch of bull. Uh, this is all in your head. He's a charlatan. She got off the phone. Her mother was baking Christmas cookies. She had a couple Christmas cookies. Two hours later, she was in the bathroom, severe GI distress. I talked to her on the phone. She said, why won't my doctor you know, learn from this? I said, look, you can't see unless your eyes were open. When I met Big Ed 28 years ago, Luckily, for some reason, my eyes were open. And for instance, Dale Bredesen from The End of Alzheimer's and David Perlmutter, Grain Brain and Drop Acid. We joke that people from you know, the neurology community and the people from cardiology and cardiac surgery, all we talk about is the gut because everything comes from the gut, just like Hippocrates said. And I'm learning that. Remember, Sickness is good for business. Sickness will exist whether or not we follow the Dr. Gundry diet. Do you agree? Uh, depends. You're saying you could eliminate all disease? Hippocrates believed it. I see well, it every I, day. I'm not no. asking Hippocrates. Uh, you no, know, I, yeah, I think. I mean, that, just think about the statement you're yeah, making. You're saying you could eliminate you can, all disease. Yeah. I mean, yeah. then well, we're in the midst of a profit. Why do you think I keep working six days a week at my age when I don't have to? Because I get to see these things happen. And the more I see of it, the more I firmly believe that Hippocrates was right. Do you Just see like why, Alessio Fasano. Do you now see why it. I see a lack of humility in a statement? This where is you not. Can, I get to watch miracles every day. But That's so why do I. I show up for work. But so do I. When I start my patient, I'm at Foreman and their hemoglobin A1C drops. I see a miracle too. Yeah, but you're trying you're trying to patch up the underlying cause. But, sure. But my don't, patients don't always follow the lifestyle guidance. But your I, patient, like, I do you like know metformin. Why, but do you know why your patients follow your guidance versus mine don't always follow mine? Because usually they're at their wits end. Yes. And because you've pre-selected the patients who want to follow your guidance. I don't call them up. No, they call you. <laughs> They've pre-selected you. Okay. So if I took your model yeah. and then started doing it on my patients, it would not have the same effect. Let's because try. it's not a pre-selected... But we have tried it. We've tried it with all the research that Dr. Bellardo has proven that if you eat high fruit concentrations, you live longer. Leon Hart study, you eat grains, you live longer. And these are all the things no, you advocate against. No, you get alpha acid in your body. And legumes. But you also live longer. <laughs> 
Um, no one's arguing about the ALA. What we're saying is that you live longer by consuming a high grain diet in the Leon Heart Study. And you're arguing against those things. And, and you live longer if you smoke in some of these areas. But Whoa. that's not, it's not because <laughs> if you smoke, it's in spite it's of in smoke. Spite. No, you're wrong. But how? You are wrong. You know smoking is pro, is pro inflammatory. Nicotinic acid is one of the best mitochondrial and yeah. Dr. Gunn, do we have to British, end this conversation? The British doctor no, study showed that. Good. We need to at least end British with smoking. British smoker, <laughs> British doctors who smoke have a 30% less incidence of Parkinson's and yeah, dementia. Yeah, because they die of 10 other diseases <laughs> beforehand. No. So. Dr. Dr. Gundry, I, had, I have one, thing, one anecdote to share with you. I had a patient in residency who reversed their, I actually don't like using the word reverse, sorry, put their diabetes into remission, improve mm -hmm. their hemoglobin A1C. This was not on the advice of myself. This is just something I observed that the patient told me. This patient went from eating just a ton of processed foods, whatever, and went on a cocaine binge for a few months, okay? Literally a cocaine binge and um, eating Twinkies, candy bars, but low calorie. And their hemoglobin A1C and their high res CRP totally normalized. Yeah. From that anecdote, would we be universally recommending cocaine and Twinkies as a diet? Of course not, right? We can't extrapolate from anecdotes. That individual lost a substantial amount of weight, which is why that happened sure. in a really negative way, right? They lost weight because they weren't eating because they were using cocaine. That is nothing I would ever recommend to patients. So a lot of the anecdotes we can all have anecdotes that we see. I mean, I have patients that are fully plant-based that go on these really extremely re restrictive diets that improve all of their biomarkers. And the reason why I don't recommend someone follows a no olive oil, whole food plant-based diet, even though it's been recommended by tons of people with tons of anecdotal evidence, is because when you look at multiple levels of evidence, we know that eating olive oil can be healthy. We know that eating fruit can be healthy. We know that you know all fat is not necessarily bad by any means. Polyunsaturated fat, incredibly healthy. And so this is why I believe anecdotes, while they're interesting, we have to base our recommendations off of the most robust outcome data with evaluating various levels of evidence. Yeah, I, I was lost when we're saying Lectins are pro-inflammatory, so we should stop eating them. And smoking is pro-inflammatory, but it extends life in yeah. some conditions. No, the, the pro-inflammatory of smoking can be countered by a high polyphenol diet. It can't. Period. I can't. Well, then how do these guys make it so long? How does my grandpa, who eats the most unhealthy, mm -hmm. low vitamin C diet, live to 95 when he smoked? Yeah, that's what I'm asking you. Yeah, I... This is the I. This is in medicine. We have to have the humility to say I don't know. And my answer to you is I don't know. And I could state that. But let's without, find that out. We should. Well, that's no why one, I do what I do. No, let's find but there's out a difference between works. saying let's find out versus I'm the prophet with the answer. Not a prophet. But when you say you can end all disease, that's prophetic. No, all disease comes from the gut, and all disease can end from the gut. That's all I'm saying. How does AIDS happen from the gut? Well, actually, there's some interesting evidence that the microbiome in AIDS patients is totally different. Well, yeah, and because you, they have an autoimmune, you, they have no, an immune and you, disease. And you can change their microbiome. How does herpes ha the, on the lip happen from the gut? I mean, some of these that, say, actually, how does a blocked gland in my eye happen? Like, we have to be believe it humble or, here. Believe it or not, there's now really cool evidence that hearing loss is because of dysbiosis in the gut, period. When you say really great evidence, I'm curious yeah. what goes through your mind. Uh, <laughs> what goes through my mind is in the next book, believe it or not, there's really strong correlation between mitochondrial dysbiosis and hearing loss. There's a really good correlation between ice cream sales and shark attacks as well. Uh, and I found no. that to be not very valuable. Yeah. So why not manipulate the gut microbiome and find out? I which would, is what if, there I was, if there was quality evidence, I would. You don't, look, I, can, I have a channel here with 12 million subscribers. I can sell them probiotics and make a ton of money. I could sell them your probiotics. In fact, you'd probably sell me your probiotics. I could sell it to my audience and make millions of dollars I'd and help people. I'd much rather you sell prebiotics and postbiotics. Deal, okay. How's that? I would sell those to my audience. You think I'm withholding making money. You think I'm withholding helping patients be out of principle? No. Then why do you think I'm not selling those things? 
uh, because maybe you don't believe the evidence that they work like, like I do. How's that? But the evidence that you believe they do is not based on human outcomes. That's the problem. They're actually- You, you just said that you found some correlational data and it leads you to make this sweeping recommendation- Not of just selling. Me. Yes, not why just don't you, you read, but you're the person in the room that why, I'm discussing yeah, with. Why don't you read Alessio Fasano, professor at Harvard, if you don't believe I mean, well, again, It's called authority bias. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, no, I just, I don't want to talk to those people because I'm talking to you okay. and we're seeing correlations and we're seeing mechanisms and we're seeing your theories, which you admitted are unproven. That was your statement from earlier. They are theories. And if they're just theories- Just like the cholesterol hypothesis of coronary artery disease, is a hypothesis. There are oh, multiple but, other hypotheses. But it's oh, not. Oh, oh, no, no, no. It's no. not. It is a hypothesis. We know that elevated chole LDL cholesterol is causative without a doubt but in atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. We know that. Why? <laughs> yeah, we do know why. Why? Are you asking like from like a God sense why? No. I mean, in other words, what is it? about having a high LDL cholesterol that's so bad for you. Because I have patients, quite frankly, who have LDL cholesterols of 400 and have an absolutely normal CT coronary angiogram. And that is not typical. And that is a very, that is, you were talking about a unicorn. That is very rare. We know from all the research so, but, of people with actual, with familial hypercholesterolemia, we know that regardless of uh, some, we know that uh, there's factors of metabolic health that lead to yes. increased ASCVD. We know that diabetes increases risk. Yes. We know hypertension increases risk, but all of that completely controlled for, irrespective, isolated, elevated ApoB in and of itself causes ASCVD, which is why our, our all of all of our um, but most of us are not are. measuring LPPLA two levels because it's most clinically us, insignificant. Well, it is clinically <laughs> significant. <laughs> And the assays are not un, not validated. It's funny the Cleveland Clinic uses it. It's uh, <laughs> uh, Cleveland Clinic does a lot of things that um, uh, are not. I would think they'd be very or. interested in heart disease. Well, I, they. <laughs> I mean, I'm not. I'm not aware of any Cleveland Clinic physicians personally that recommend that because it's not in our guidelines because those assays aren't validated and don't have outcomes. But anyway, anyhow, ASCVD yeah. we do have an answer to at least, um, and. We at least agree ApoB is causative. We don't have answers for everything. And in medicine, you're aware of this. As more evidence comes out, we update our, our yeah, changes thank you, thank in, in practice. Like you used to poop in a bucket as a med student. And now we actually <laughs> have, in Harvard, they freeze dried capsules in order to deliver these fecal transplants. Rapsules. So we, we, <laughs> we literally will take what we learned and we update our guidance. And from there, we need to have a strong layer of skepticism before we accept something as a changing of the way we do things. I, ex I completely agree with you. And I do not feel the caliber of the evidence that you use to make certain statements reach the level that we should make generalized claims that apples are horrible, that smoking isn't bad as long as you have high uh, antioxidant levels, because those are dangerous statements to make because they mislead people into thinking that smoking is safe, that apples are bad, and they might as well eat a Milky Way. And ultimately, I know that's not what you want. I Correct. know you genuinely want to help people. You want to help people off of ultra-processed foods. You want to help people get to a healthy weight, higher muscle mass, lower fat. Those are the things you want. It's the mechanism by which, we're talking about mechanisms. The mechanism by which you chose to get here is very dangerous. And I'm telling you this, because while you're an expertise with your patients, I'm an expertise at mass communication. I have 25 million subscribers of people who listen to every word I say and correct every mistake I make. And I could tell you how your information very confidently lands with them. And it doesn't land in the way you intend it to. And I just urge that in your upcoming books and the speeches that you make, just take that into consideration. Because when you make statements like apples are horrible, the, the worst thing you could do for your mitochondria is a fruit smoothie, it's not just taking a little bit of liberty with information, it's truly misleading people to make bad decisions for their health. So That's all I'll say. In every one of my books, I tell people, if you do not smoke, smoking is bad for you, but we should learn what is it in cigarettes? We should learn. That is a factor we in should these learn. people who are long lived. We should learn. Okay. That's what I'm saying. No one's and against And if you want to 
raise triglycerides, one of the best ways to do it is fructose. And I happen to think triglycerides are a real problem in cardiovascular disease, and we might agree about that. The triglycerides are a problem, but okay. fruit does not. Fruit in and of itself does not, in the whole food form, doesn't raise triglycerides by itself. And I say reverse juice. Get all the fruit you want, put it in a juicer, throw the juice away, and eat the pulp. Well, I agree. We at oh, least all agree. We'll agree with we that. all. Oh, I love all the right. pulp. We all agree yeah. that juicing is yeah. a bad idea. Right. See? Yeah. So again, just that's we that's my agree. only word of caution. Yeah, I think there's a lot we agree upon. I think it's the mechanism by which we disagreed. I hope the audience got something out of it. Now, I appreciate you taking the time to have a critical debate because a lot of people wouldn't take that conversation. So I'm um, first and foremost very grateful that you're willing to have Pleasure. this debate. And thank you, fun. Dr. Yeah. Bilardo, for uh, the feedback and uh, all the work that you do with the cardiology Thanks. associations across the globe. Um, gut check. We're looking forward to January 9th. Gut check. <laughs> all right, thank you, Dr. Gundry, <laughs> Dr. Bilardo. Another popular offender in this class is goop. Click here to check out my takedown and as always, stay happy and healthy.